Welcome to the market update for the fourth quarter. The last six months of the year, COVID provided us whiplash, seemingly near the end of the pandemic in July, only to have Delta in the fall and Omicron in December. It would be great to have an update that didn't include COVID, but we're not quite there yet. The fourth quarter was positive for the equity markets and relatively flat for fixed income. The themes that are driving markets remain the same. COVID levels and related to COVID, the normalization of monetary policy, known as tightening, real estate and regulatory concerns in China, and the theme we will discuss most with clients and prospects is inflation. Let's start with a COVID chart from JP Morgan. I'm sure you're all well aware of Omicron, which showed up just in time for the holidays. Personally, I knew more people that caught the virus in two weeks than in two years, and I'm sure many of you had the same experience. Omicron's a double-edged sword. So looking at the blue line that shows a huge spike in cases, but the black line is deaths, which is flattening. So while Omicron is a highly transmissible, or the highly transmissible variant, there's hope that the, as the country catches this seemingly mild variant, we may finally be able to build natural immunity to future variants, which could bring the long-awaited herd immunity. On that thought, the first week of market activity reflects the belief that herd immunity is likely. Rates have risen sharply to start the year, reflecting inflation and continued economic expansion. And in equities, we've seen a rotation from large growth stocks to cyclical stocks, those that perform better in an economic recovery. Looking at equity returns for the quarter and the year. The S&P 500 returned 11% on the quarter and over 28% for the year. Over the last three years, we've seen just over 26% in annualized returns. The Russell 2000, or small cap index, returned just over 2% for the quarter and just under 15% for the year, roughly half of that of the S&P 500. International markets continue to lag those of the U.S. The MSCI EFI index returned 2.7% on the quarter and 11.2% for the year. The three-year analyzed average is 13.5%, again, roughly half of those seen in the U.S. The MSCI Emerging Markets Index lost 1% on the quarter and 30 basis points for the year, a sharp divergence from the rest of the world. Remember that China is roughly 34% of the Emerging Markets Index. And China faces concerns over the real estate market with possible defaults, and also investor concern over continued government regulation for their technology names. For the year, the Chinese index was down over 21%, driven by technology and real estate. This was the main driver of negative emerging market returns. In previous updates, we mentioned that market impact, or the market impact of the, of the large names in the US equity market, many of these are the household tech bangman names. These names are experiencing some of the widest divergence in terms of valuation from the rest of the market. So while large cap techs have been, have been big drivers of US equity performance, they also know are very expensive relative to the rest of the market. In this webinar, we included the returns for the top seven names of the S&P 500, with a return of 13% on the quarter and 36% for the year. Lastly, I'll note that the best returns for the quarter and the year are from the Wilshire Real Estate Index at 17 and 46%. REITs have over twice the yield of U.S. stocks at 2.9%, and were also driven in 2021 by a stronger economic recovery, including increasing rents and occupancy rates seen during the year. Looking at the Morningstar style boxes for the quarter, the key thing to note here is the left columns of both boxes. This represents the value style, and as you can see, value has largely outpaced growth for 2021. We would expect value to outperform growth last year, a year with strong economic expansion, sharply higher inflation expectations, and rising rate expectations. Note that since the year 2010, growth has largely outperformed value, but headed into 2022, value looks attractive from a valuation perspective because value stocks are significantly cheaper, and as rates are expected to rise, this has been historically a tailwind for value names. Before we look at fixed income, let's take a quick look at the U.S. yield curve. Looking at the red curve, that was a year ago when we started 2021. And remember, we were somewhat optimistic for the vaccines to end COVID, the economy was starting to improve, and we also were aided by a massive federal spending bill that passed in January of last year. The blue line is three months ago, a large shift higher in interest rates across the board, largely reflecting rising inflation. And the green line is the end of December, showing much higher rates in the front end with some curve flattening. So why is that? Well, because now the market is expecting rate hikes, which impacts the short end of the curve. 
Looking at expectations for interest rates, I mentioned that we are expecting interest rates to rise. And this chart shows that we're now looking at three interest rate hikes of 25 basis points in 2022. Now let's remember how this has changed. One year ago, the market was pricing in the first rate hike in April of 2024. Last August, six months ago, the market was pricing in the first rate hike in August of 2023. So in a year, the expectations for rate hikes have been pulled forward by more than two years, this in response to economic growth and inflation that has spiked for the last six months. In addition, last week the Federal Reserve minutes indicated more hawkishness than expected. Beyond expectations for higher interest rates, there are also discussions about shrinking the Fed balance sheet. So in 2022, we're likely to have a scenario of the Fed tightening, stopping balance sheet expansion, and then moving to fully balance sheet contraction. This is a significant amount of monetary policy tightening in a short amount of time, and very different than the backdrop of the last 22 months. With higher rates across the board, there are negative returns for the broad bond index, the Bloomberg Global Aggregate, and also the U.S. Treasury Index. For 2021, the returns were four and, or minus 4 and minus 2% respectively. However, the High Yield Index posted a positive 70 basis points on the quarter, and just over 5% for the year, as investors sought high-risk bonds and as spreads versus Treasury compressed. Investors sought higher risk bonds as the economic outlook improved and the chances for default decreased. The U.S. inflation-linked index was up 2.5% on the quarter and 6% on the year, as inflation concerns grew in the U.S. and U.S. rates moved higher. This is something I will discuss with Dave later in, in the webinar. Lastly, the Bloomberg Commodity Index lost over 1.5% for the quarter, but was up over 27% for the year. So remember that the Commodity Index's largest component is energy at roughly 30%, and energy prices are sharply higher on the year. This is, again, part of the inflation theme that's one of the main drivers of 2022. That wraps up the market update for the fourth quarter.